Okay, I think um, we can get started with our program today. Please continue enjoying your breakfast. And uh, it is now my pleasure to uh, introduce our sponsor today. Um, Amy Tardif is Vice President and of, um, uh, of Wealth Man and Wealth Manager at uh, Bar Harbor uh, Wealth Management. So uh, Amy's gonna do the honor of introducing our board chair who will, um, has some pleasant duties to do. So come on up, Amy. Thank you, Tim. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of Bar Harbor Wealth Management, I'd like to thank the Chamber for the opportunity to sponsor this morning. Uh, this is an exciting morning for us. It's the first sponsorship that we've done under the new Bar Harbor Wealth Management name, uh, which will be official later this year, uh, but we're rolling it out a little early, so we're all excited about that. Uh, Charter Trust Company has been part of the Bar Harbor Bank and Trust family since 2017. Uh, we've operated several wealth management departments separately, um, but we're thrilled we're going to be able to roll them all in together. And the new name better describes the breadth of services we offer, as well as our proud partnership with Bar Harbor Bank and Trust. So now I will turn the presentation over to Tanya Rochette. She'll be doing the presentations for Police Officer of the Year and Firefighter of the Year. Tanya is Director of Human Resources at NAMI, New Hampshire, and the current board chair at the Concord Chamber of Commerce. Good morning, everybody. Um, kind of intimidating walking in here this morning with all these blue uniforms. I was thinking, okay, what did I do last weekend? What did, I, what did my kids do? So, but thank you all for being here. This is a great event, amazing turnout. Um, and I have the distinct honor of presenting these two awards, one to our Firefight of the Year and one to our Police Officer of the Year. And I understand our Police Officer of the Year is not aware of this honor just yet, but I'm going to say this person's name um, right off the bat because this letter that's been written is absolutely amazing. And bear with me because there's a lot to cover. Nicole Murray joined the Police Department on December 9, 2007 and graduated on March 28, 2008 in the 145th class of New Hampshire Police Academy. Officer Murray was assigned to the patrol division earned a transfer assignment to serve as a detective in the Youth Services Unit in April 2012. Prior to becoming a Concord police officer, Nicole graduated with a bachelor's degree in criminal investigations from the State University of New York College of Technology. During the summer of 2019, in a 10-day period, Concord police officers responded to a series of critical incidents that included four homicides and three suicides. Detective Murray re received investigative assignments in many, if not all, of these cases. Later in 2019, police op officials debriefed with the first responders and, detectors and detectives to learn about the department's response, efficiency, and effectiveness. By all accounts, Concord police personnel performed admirably during these incidents. Their actions were swift, coordinated, and conducted as a full team effort. However, a lesson learned from this debriefing was that the department lacked adequate inventory of crime scene processing resources and had dated technology. Detective Murray took a leading role in redeveloping the police department's crime scene response and evidence collection inventory and technologies. In January 2020, Detective Murray attended the 51st session of the 10-week National Forensic Academy at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. Detective Murray is the first Concord police officer to attend this prestigious program. And in addition to her fulfilling all the requirements for completion of the academy, she also completed an additional 80 hours of coursework in shooting, incident reconstruction, and bloodstain pattern analysis. Upon returning from the National Forensic Training Academy, Detective Murray established several three-day training program opportunities so that she could pass along her knowledge and experience to other Concord police officers and even make space available for other officers from police departments in Merrimack County. With the support of the city manager, mayor, and city council, the police department was able to secure capital funding in July 2020 to acquire a new crime scene response vehicle and took it and stock it with much needed supplies and current technologies. Once again, Detective Murray took a leading role in the acquisition of this vehicle and equipment. She devoted countless hours meeting and corresponding with vehicle manufacturers to design it into the department's desired specifications. In addition, she spent hours researching evidence, equipment, and supplies to ensure that the crime scene response vehicle was sufficiently stocked when it was delivered in July 2021. 
She continues today to teach new and seasoned police officers the best practices in crime scene processing and is considered by her commanders, supervisors, and peers as a subject matter expert in the area that is continually changing and evolving. In addition to her work as a detective in the Youth Services Unit and a subject matter expert in crime scene processing, Detective Murray serves as a de devoted member to the Concord Police Department Honor Guard, serves as a liaison between the Police Department and Merrimack County Attorney's Office, and serves on the advisory board for the Sexual Assault Nurse Examiner Organization, and serves on the advisory board for the Merrimack County Child Advocacy Center. Detective Murray has been recognized with numerous letters of accommodation for many accomplishments during her career. She has received four commendation bars, one in 2012 for distinguished unit action for her efforts in an investigation apprehension of an individual committed burglaries at two restaurants on Loudon Road. 2014, she received the bar for distinguished unit action for efforts in investigating of a physical assault on a disabled adolescent. Three individuals were convicted of assault, two of which were sentenced to prison terms for nine to 30 years. In 2016, a bar for meritorious service for investigative efforts in multi-state fraud investigations where two individuals were ultimately arrested. And in 2017, a distinguished unit action for investigation efforts and apprehension of an individual for possession of child sexual abuse images. Detective Nicole Murray is being recognized as an exceptional police officer who re represents the city of Concord and its police department in the highest traditions. Detective Mer Murray's service to our citizens and attitude towards her work is highly commendable. Can I please have Detective Nicole Murray come to the stage? <laughs> I am blown away. I did not expect this. They, uh, they really pulled the, the rug out from under me. So <laughs> um, This is not done alone. This is done um, with a lot of support of uh, other folks uh, in my corner. So <laughs> thank you very much. And our next award is for our firefighter of the year. Sorry, forgot about these, getting old. And this award's going to firefighter Andrew Patterson. Firefighter Andrew Patterson consistently dedicates much of his time and effort to develop his own crew, as well as others that operate the Tower Ladder Company. He's always willing to assist new firefighters assigned to the Tower Company in the driver operator qualification process. Drew also is also sought out by other experienced tower operators on how they can improve their trade, as well as for feedback on their performance. His contributions extend beyond the operations in the tower ladder. He is regularly involved with projects at the central station, such as designing and building a storage rack on top of the boat trailer, allowing for storage and transportation of the swift water raft for water rescue incidents. Drew is also on this SCBA technician, one of the SCBA technicians for the responsible for the repairs, maintenance, and testing of all the department's air packs, cylinders, regulators, and face pieces. He often assists the capital station, central station captain with repairs and purchases belonging to the small tools and equipment program. Firefighter Patterson's contributions do not stop at the station. His efforts better the department as a whole. He was a member of the recent ex extrication committee. I'm sorry, I definitely was, was going to say that wrong. No. <laughs> Extrication Committee, which is responsible for researching purchasing airbags, stabilization equipment, and newer battery-operated vehicle ex extradition equipment. That, I'm not going to say that word anymore. You'll know what I mean. <laughs> that met the needs of the department. It currently, um, goodness, now I've lost my place. Drew's work with this committee involves regular meetings, traveling to view other departments' apparatuses, and meetings with vendors. He's also one of the members appointed by Local 1045 to the Fire Department Safety Committee. His wealth of knowledge and mechanical aptitude combined with his strong firefighting skills make him an ideal mentor for newer members. Beyond that, his calm demeanor, sound decision-making abilities, and reputation as the idea guy make him a go-to employee for not only his company officer, station captain, battalion chief, but his 
opinion is highly respect respected by the department command staff as well. For these reasons, coupled with his unwavering commitment to improve the Concord Fire Department at all levels, that firefighter, Drew Patterson, is presented with this award for Firefighter of the Year. And I understand that he's not available today. And on his behalf, Interim Fire Chief John Chisholm will be accepting the award. Hi, good morning. Um, thank you everyone for coming. Unfortunately, Drew had some prior family commitments and couldn't make it today. Uh, I just do want to echo the sentiments of the write-up. Uh, Drew is a true utility player for the fire department. Um, command staff really does um, value his opinion. He is one of those senior members that may not uh, have the uh, official leadership uh, capacity or authority but he certainly is one of the people that helps drive our department forward. So um, I wish you were here today to accept this and I uh, appreciate it. Thank you. <sighs> All right, sorry I took so much time on that, but gosh, that's pretty amazing. So now I get to introduce Mayor Jim Boulay and City Manager Thomas Bell. Mayor Belay has been a member of the City Council in the City of Concord since 1998, when he was like 12. He served as the Ward 10 City Councilor from January 98 through December 2007. He served as our City's Mayor since 2008. Mayor Belay is a partner in the firm of Dennehy & Belay, a Concord governmental consulting firm. He graduated from the University of New Hampshire in 1988 Wildcats, with a BA in Political Science. He'll be speaking to us in a few minutes up at this lovely white table, ready for all your questions, make them hard. And city, city Manager Thomas Bell was recruited to join Concord in 98 and served as the city's first director of community development. In 2001, he was appointed as assistant city manager, and since 2005, he served as a city manager. He received his bachelor's degree in government and a master's degree in public administration from both Suffolk University and a certificate in state and local government from the Kennedy School at Harvard University. Let me welcome them up to the stage. Oh, I'm sorry. Wait, I forgot something. No, we're good. Up to the podium. Oh, up, up to the podium. Sorry. <laughs> this is my first time up here hosting this. Who is introducing them? Oh. I'm sorry, I thought you both didn't make it the same time. Are you going to do that? Tom's going to do it. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. All right, there we go. What do we say? Welcome to another great day in the city, right? <laughs> See, Joe, teach, he taught me well. So, um, First, by, let me start by saying congratulations, Detective uh, Murray and uh, Firefighter uh, Patterson. Uh, they are but uh, simply representatives of outstanding departments, both in the police and fire, but it's their work which um, we all as citizens really appreciate, and um, I can't thank you enough. I can tell you that my family's had some personal experience with uh, these departments this year. Uh, my father got hit by a car yesterday, so that boss for Big Nut was incredibly, uh, it, I can't tell you, you know, when, you don't always want them to show up, but when they do, it's amazing the effect that uh, the police department can have in just calming a situation. And uh, what you did to make my father feel better is, is incredible. Um, I decided to break a leg this year, so I had to call the fire department. Uh, you all owe me a new suit for cutting my suit open, all right? <laughs> I may have broke my leg, but you cut my suit, all right? <laughs> uh, but the care that they gave me is outstanding. So I personal thank you for both. Um, I first want to say thank you also to the Chamber of Commerce for hosting this. Uh, Tim, your whole team is outstanding, and what you do for the city is phenomenal, so I greatly appreciate it. Uh, Trieste, I have a little bit of an issue with you. Uh, I want to thank you for up, you changed it, but you finally, my picture uh, that they sent out finally caught up to me. That we had used the same picture for 14 years, which I thought I had hair and it was good, but <laughs> apparently that's, a lot of times have changed. Um, I also want to recognize, I do have uh, some of my fellow counselors here with me today that I want to just recognize, and if you just mind, kind of just nod, wave your hand if you will. I have um, uh, uh, Counselor uh, Byron Champlin, who serves at large. I have Counselor McLaughlin from Ward 6, there we go. Um, I have uh, Counselor Brown from Ward 5, welcome, good to see you. And uh, Counselor Pierce from the Honorable 
Ward, what are you, two, three? What are you? <laughs> he knows why I do that. Um, so I also want to recognize uh, it's nice to uh, not only have see wonderful faces here, but uh, it always helps to have family in the audience. And uh, my favorite engineer of the year, my always my MVP, Aaron Lambert, and my son Jackson, who uh, I like to refer to as my retirement, is here as well. So it's good to see both of you. <clears throat> Glad to see Jackson got up early enough to see his father do this. Uh, <laughs> right? Right? All right, okay. Um, <clears throat> So, he probably, he's got an 11 handicap. I think he can get that down a little lower, all right? Um, so I am proud to say that the state of the city um, are, are, is financially strong and we are in a, on a very positive uh, trajectory. Um, Tom and I sat down to go over this presentation as we do each year and we had asked Tim, what would you like from us? And Tim basically said, people like to know projects. They want to know what's going on. So we've really focused a whole lot on projects this year. Uh, we skipped some of the financial. I want to touch upon it briefly, but we're really going to talk a lot about projects and what you're going to see and what roads to probably avoid this summer as they get ripped up and such. So that's, those, that's your tip. Um, <clears throat> um, so with that, we'll start. <coughs> Holy smoke, that what? That picture wasn't supposed to be there, but since it's there, I'd like you all to introduce you to my new grandson, which was born yesterday. So yes, that is Callum Flanders, both his mom and his dad, and Callum are doing just fine, happy and healthy, and I may be a great, proud grandfather, so there you go. That's my part of this, all right? <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, and I did ask if I could do that with the parents, and they said, yeah, okay, fine. So I asked permission. Um, so uh, we want to touch upon our fiscal management. I think it's important to recognize that we do still have a AA plus uh, bond rating with Sanders and Poor's. Um, that is really important, as you all know, if we, as we do projects and we finance projects to get the best bond rating we can. That is really critical, and I think um, that bond rating speaks to the fact of the next two items. Uh, for the 26th year in a war year, uh, we've received the Certificate of Excellence in uh, Finance Reporting, as well as the, we've uh, received for seven years in a row now the Distinguished uh, Budget Presentation Award. So I think that speaks well for Tom uh, and his whole team. I'd like to give the, the council all the credit, but they do great work. Uh, I think it's important to recognize um, the imp impact COVID had just on our budget. You notice in 2020, our budget was one, uh, 109.2 million, but yet it dipped in 2021 to 106, and this year we're back to 109. The reason for that dip is we basically held off on a lot of our capital projects, didn't do those things. So this number you see, the 109.3 million, is the combination of both the operating costs and the capital costs. So the savings was really, or the, the reduction was really stopping doing some of those capital projects. And you don't want to stop them for too long because eventually they're going to catch up to you, just like your own house. You got to keep, you know, fix the roof, fix the, the driveway, et cetera, whatever. Um, it's also important to note, and it uh, doesn't say on the slide, but you know, of the 109, 68 million is the operating budget <clears throat> portion. And I always remind you that 30% of the tax base uh, in the city of Concord is non-taxable. So 70% of the rest of you are picking that cost up. Um, in terms of uh, some of the things we want to talk about, I think it's important to talk about public safety first and some of the things you've probably read um, uh, recently. Um, our fire department, uh, the large uh, green ring, portion of the ring, if you will, that is, um, in terms of calls for service, that is the EMS uh, ambulatory stuff. 69% of all the calls are, um, are EMS. 3%, the smaller uh, down towards the bottom, is our fires. Um, so our overwhelming uh, call for service really comes from ambulatory. So in 2020, we had uh, 8,777 calls. 2021, we had 9,721 calls. We had actually anticipated that year only receiving about uh, 8,900, and we exceeded that. And this year, uh, 2020, we are approaching quickly 10,000 calls for service. There is a significant pressure on our fire department. So we have created a new position, the Advanced Emergency Medical Technician, and the, uh, we currently have eight employees in that new position. We're also uh, in the hiring process of three additional candidates, and of those three spots, uh, one will be a paramedic and two will be the uh, uh, AEMTs. 
So we'll have 10 AEMTs projected as of May 1st is the goal. Um, this year, on the fiscal year 22, which we're currently in, we uh, purchased uh, two ambulances at, and want to guess how much they cost? That's right, $275,000 each. These are not cheap. Uh, we have five ambulances in total. Uh, three are on the front line, and we keep uh, two in reserve. And uh, we also have, in terms of uh, ambulances, we tend to keep them, you know, I often get questions about you know, the movement and how long do you have them and the wear and tear. We keep four, uh, these four years on the front line and we have another additional four years uh, in reserve. So for the upcoming fiscal year, they'll be looking for a ladder truck, which is estimated at $1.5 million to have a ladder truck. And currently we have two ladder trucks, one is on the front line and one is reserve. And we keep those for approximately eight years on the front line and eight years in reserve. So we've talked a lot about the EMS, and uh, if you've paid attention to city council to help you go to sleep at night, you'll notice that we uh, talked a lot about additional ambulance, which I think is critically important to the city. City council has already taken, I think this is important, the first step by moving uh, to a staffing of 20 positions on duty at all time. The minimum staffing was increased um, and the advanced life support services are targeted to be achieved as often as possible. It will take an additional four firefighter paramedics to be able to staff a new ambulance and an, an, an annual operating cost of approximately $900,000 and an additional $300,000 for the purchase of an, an additional ambulance. So the new ambulance will need to be replaced approximately every four years. Our, fire, our police department um, also saw such dramatic increases in our calls for service. In 2020, uh, we had 43,290 calls for service. Think about that in a year, 43,000 calls plus. In 2021, it went to 45,100, and we had estimated about 42, and it far exceeded that. And in this year, 22, 22 fiscal 22, we estimated um, that uh, well, we're approaching uh, 53,000 now, and with a, we're, next fiscal year, we're looking at about 54,000 calls for service in the police department. Uh, these departments are extremely stressed, if I, if I can't emphasize it enough. You know, with the current um, uh, New Hampshire, the state of New Hampshire and our communities not immune, uh, experiencing a drug epidemic uh, between heroin, uh, the fentanyl, the emergence of the meth uh, continues to be a growing uh, concern across the state in, in, in New Hampshire and Concord as well. So as we continue to grow as a city, and we just saw the new census, we've grown, uh, combined with the ongoing drug crisis, there continues to be a steady rate of, of criminal offenses. Um, there's not many days that we don't go to an overdose and, and other type calls. So, you know, it's our desire as a city council, we've always supported community policing and interactions um, and activities, but the problem is these are becoming more and more difficult to do as we're dealing more often with these direct um, safety initiatives as they take a priority. And I want to point out, I think this is really important for the community to know, that um, I think uh, the chief and I have been, well, we both graduated from UNH together, and um, I think you've been on the force but almost as long as I've been around here, so. <laughs> um, but the same number of patrol officers that when he started are the same today. We can't sustain, and I'm, this is where Tom gets nervous because I'm going off script here, but you know, we can't sustain these additional calls uh, with the same number of folks. So this is something that we as a council are really gonna have to wrestle with next year. Um, wanted to talk a little bit about some of the things you're gonna see in the next um, uh, council meeting and, and also in the next upcoming budget. We all know that parks and recreations are critical to the health of our community. And um, one of the issues was, uh, that we're going to talk about is the White Park um, splash pad. So our city uh, staff has been working uh, with HL Turner Group and the Ironwood Group review uh, the White Park site in, in all and researched other local splash pads and developing a concept that might work for White Park. So there are two main benefits um, to operating with a splash pad. One was limited number of employees to open because we, we've talked about some of the staffing issues we've had. And the staff only need to be certified in CPR and first aid and not life guide cert certified. And number two is they have the ability to open it earlier and to stay open longer compared to the regular pool season. So our Recreation and Parks Committee, who are a bunch of dedicated volunteers, they met in January. They gave their full support to a um, uh, splash pad at what was considered now the uh, White Park Kitty Pool. Um, 
The estimated cost of a splash pad is about $650,000 with another $100,000 to update the current buildings. That would be the bathrooms and the pump house building, et cetera. Um, and we were thinking they should, maybe would match the Merrimack Lodge, which we recently did. And the committee actually said, you know what? We, we are fully supportive of the $650,000 for the splash pad, but we think you can come back with um, some better options, less expensive for the $100,000 with the buildings and such. So in the current fiscal year, today, 22, um, we're scheduled to renovate uh, White Park Pool in FY23. And that renovation is we've been working through all these uh, city pools, and we have seven city pools across the city, which I think uh, we all can all agree are really important. So you can walk and access these pools easily. But that we budgeted $550,000 to renovate. So rather than renovating and use that money for the kiddie pool, we're looking at um, the recommendation of the Parks and Recs Committee to convert the pool to a splash pad. And um, so that's, that's one of the things that you can see we're looking at. The second that we'll be talking about soon, <clears throat> uh, you may have read uh, about uh, a golf course, uh, Beaver Meadow Golf Course, recently. It's been in the news uh, considerably. And you know, I look at it not as a golf course, but I look at it as a city asset. <clears throat> So one of the things uh, that has been very popular during the winter is uh, cross-country skiing. And um, in fact, I think uh, even Tim, I've seen you out there a few times. Um, so we looked to uh, replace a new ski groomer. Um, and it, that we said, well, we, the city would do about 50,000, the cross-country ski community about two, uh, 50,000, and we could get a, you know, a, a trailer groomer with a snowmobile type thing. And, Recently, we've had a, the fortune to come across from the Holderness School a, screen, a new groomer, ski groomer, for $91,000. Um, it also, we would need like a shipping container to store it. This would be about $6,000. And so the Holderness School, um, they did this for many years and uh, they had a small building, so we would just replicate that. Um, they also, the cross country uh, group, the private group, is putting together a $5,000 for equipment repair fund for the future. And so, with that, um, the 91000 plus the six, it's about $48,000 uh, a piece between the city and uh, the, uh, the cross country group. And I think that's important to recognize that it really does make this area, the community, a, a, a full year round um, um, with quality skiing and such. I want to talk about housing um, and some of the commercial development going on in the community. Um, every two weeks, all the mayors across the state, we have a uh, Zoom call. We were actually brought together by uh, Governor Sununu during the COVID uh, times, and we actually kept it going because we realized that it's almost like group therapy for us. Uh, we recognize that the, the issues in Manchester and Keene and Portsmouth and are not unique to, to those communities, but they are uh, spill over into all of our communities. And housing is one of those across the state that we are all feeling and struggling with. I also goes to say that I think strongly that the cities have done an outstanding job at trying to create new capacity, more capacity for housing. And I think some of the issues rely with some of your smaller municipalities. In fact, there's a bill, uh, Senate Bill 400 this year in the legislature, which sets up a whole different set of criteria. And I think you had the governor here. Um, I believe this crowd's actually bigger than what the governor had, probably. <laughs> so if I tell him that, that's okay? Thank you, Tim. Um, so the fact that we have a bigger crowd for the governor, but he was here and it was great. Um, he talked about Senate Bill 400 in terms of housing and creating a menu of opportunities to uh, advance housing throughout the state. And I'm glad to see that he um, spoke a lot about uh, trying to encourage that in some of our small communities as well. One of the, issues, one of the groups, as you can see, the, the, Allied Leonard, uh, the old tannery site, uh, now it's Pentecook Landing, and this is uh, the phase one. Uh, phase one was 34 units, over 31 affordable uh, units of mixed one and two bedrooms, and it was completed in October of 2020. This is the site today, and you'll notice the yellow uh, colored in is phase two. Phase two is 20 units, 18 affordable units, a uh, mix of one and two bedrooms. The construction is expected to start in the late summer of 2022, completion in the summer of 2023. Uh, 5.52 million development costs, uh, which is about 276,000 per unit. The um, also draw your attention to the other por portion, which says park area. 
um, that's the Canal Street Riverfront Park. And in FY 2022, um, $110,000 was appropriated for the design, the permit, um, and it was those were all in impact fees. So not your, not city tax dollars; those are impact fees. Uh, the firm of GPI has been selected to design the project. Um, there was uh, public participation will occur in the spring and the summer, and ideally, if we can come to agreement, the FY uh, 2023 uh, will start construction. It's estimated to cost between 1.3 to 1.8 million, depending on what we decide on the design. Uh, but I'll, I'll remind everybody that it is subject to council appropriation of the money and a whole lot of input uh, from the community uh, for the design. So the funding is a mixture of the uh, Penacook Village uh, bonds, parking fund bonds, because there's a par public parking lot reconstruction area there, uh, impact fees and grant funds. So. Um, I encourage those who live in Penacook or who care about this particular area, uh, we're gonna under, start undertaking a robust public uh, process with all the abutters and, and the area, and obviously our Recreation and Parks Advisory Committee will be uh, participating this spring and summer to, uh, I think we'll start with a real transformational project um, in that area. But I wanna bring your attention not only to that park, but the whole area in Penacook that's really highlighted. Because in 2015, the Penacook Village uh, master plan was completed that detailed the idea of a new Canal Street Riverfront Park that fits into the larger plan to create an interconnected network of parks, recreational amenities, um, and including the, um, the, for the whole village. So it includes a network of existing parks, which would be Tanner Street and Rolf Park, uh, New Canal Street, Riverfront Park, future Riverfront Parks, Trails, the former Rivco site, uh, the forthcoming uh, Merrick River Greenway Trail, Pennacook Street, and Hannah Dustin. It takes you all the way up there. That connectivity, I think, is really important and vital for that whole part of the community and the quality of life that we've talked about and enjoy in Concord. Um, more on the housing. Uh, this building should look familiar to you all. Um, get a good look at it, because hopefully it will disappear soon. Uh, but the existing building was 26,100 square feet. Uh, it's a tax exempt for decades due, it was ownership by the state, which is now owned by the city. It was declared surplus by the state back in 2011. It was purchased by the city in 2014. Um, and just, um, just of note, the city received actually 17 different proposals uh, to redo this site from eight different developers. Uh, that is the site. The, the site, uh, the interior asbestos abatement um, uh, was a cost of about $335,000 total cost. $200,000 was paid for by the Department of Environmental Services through a Brownfields grant. So you probably saw some of that work being done uh, last fall. Um, this is a, the site as proposed. Uh, the deal with uh, John Flatley Company was approved by the City Council in May of 2021. And the detail projects, the project details were there be a new 80,000 square foot building, 60 market rate apartments, um, studio one bedroom, two bedroom, 60 plus parking spaces on site. Um, with a garage in the basement of the new building and service parking lot. The projected assessed value is between eight and 10.24 million, and the projected property taxes are between 215 to $275,000 annually. The Flatley is responsible for the building demolition, including exterior uh, asbestos abatement, utility relocations, and all offsite improvements. And I apologize for going so fast, but. I know I want to get Tom, give him a chance to give you all the asked questions, so that's why I'm moving along. Uh, the ZBA gave approvals back in March uh, 2020. The planning board is actually going to be hearing uh, this proposal on April 20th, so if you're interested, you can tune in or go. Uh, and if, if, if all goes well uh, with the planning board, the, the closing is scheduled for May 31st of this year, and the construction would start June of 2022 with a completion of 20, uh, in 2023. So. I want to go through some of the housing projects um, that we've you may have heard about, but I want to really kind of show you what the city's been doing. These are, and I've grouped them together, these are particular projects which have been um, approved by the planning board and anticipated for construction in, in 2022. So we have the Dakota Partners development at Langdon Ave, that's 192 total units, workforce housing, and the phase one is to be built in 2022 this year. Uh, Brookline Opportunities LLC development, that's the eastern end of Pembroke Road, 123 units. 
of workforce. Uh, Shaker Road cluster development, 20 single family home cluster development. Sewell's Falls Road, uh, Abbott uh, Road subdivision, single family, 16 single family homes. Pennacook Landing in phase two, we just talked about the 20 units. Uh, the Josiah Bartlett Road, 11 units of single family homes, uh, cluster under development right now. And these are, these. this is um, uh, approved for the planning board and uncertain, I'm not sure when the construction is supposed to start, but there were at 70 Pembroke Road, there were 236 units approved, apartments and townhouses. Uh, we talked about the one that was set for the planning board here uh, in April, that'd be Flatley Company with the 64 market rate apartments. And then we've received several um, areas of interest. Um, we haven't received the site plans, but uh, 48 units of units in Eastern End of Concord, 96 workforce units uh, at the Eastern End of Concord and a separate uh, project, 266 market rate and assisted living units at Black uh, Hill Ro uh, Road, uh, that's off at exit 16, th pardon, uh, 13. 82 market rate units at Stickney Ave, uh, with 244 market rate units um, multifamily, single-family townhouses at Granite Place, formerly the Lincoln Financial Site, and 120 units of senior housing at Old Loud Road. So there's a lot in the network. And one of the things that um, all the communities were criticized, there was a group called Josiah Barlett uh, Group, and uh, they said that you know the, the communities were the obstacles um, for developing housing. That uh, our zoning practices, uh, fee schedules, etc. So uh, this year, the council agreed to put together a fee committee to look at all of the development fees and fees throughout the city. I've asked Council Champlin to head up that committee, and we don't want to be the obstacle. So we are reviewing all those. We are finding what is appropriate, what is not appropriate, and I think that or we're trying to be as responsive as, as we possibly can. And I think if you, when you, and it, obviously we can have conversations of the types of housing, but I think all in all, when you increase inventory, you increase um, the opportunity for everyone. Um, in terms of economic development in commercial, I just want to point a few things that you might have uh, read about or, or may uh, just refresh your memory. Uh, Graponi Mazda is coming to Concord. That is a 24,000 square foot uh, dealership at 134 Manchester Street. It was conditionally approved by the planning board on um, the 16th of March. Uh, Pitco, I'll remind you, isn't it nice Bo is sending these companies? I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> Pitco, of 356,000 square feet manufacturing facility, conditionally approved by the planning board in October of 2021. Uh, the Capital Shopping Center, I believe that's owned by Bricksmore, that uh, you'll see a Starbucks, a 110 Grill, Playa Bowls, uh, uh, and an Xfinity store, and that's expected to be under construction uh, this year. And then, of course, at Exit 17, we have the interchange development. Um, I believe the Rossios are here. Where are they? Hey, there you are. Welcome. Uh, so um, uh, they've done great work out at Exit 13 at the development. You're going to see a market basket, home goods, uh, liquor store outlet, Wendy's, and a whole lot more. And that's to be expected this summer of 2022. So that takes us to this project. It's 43 acre site off Exit 17. If I get all this wrong, you can correct me. Um, it's about 4.7 uh, million uh, in project. Uh, 4.2 were in bonds and notes to be paid for by the uh, Pentecook Village um, TIF. 90,000 approximately in impact fees and um, almost uh, 450,000 in donations from uh, the developers. And that mostly is to pay for the work that was done um, over the border in Canterbury. Phase one is about 80,000 square foot supermarket uh, with the potential to add another 20,000 square foot retail tenant on a 10 acre pad and another 13,000 square feet for the, the liquor store uh, an outlet on another four acre pad parcel. Um, the section of Hoyt Road, and I think this is important in terms of city and city tax dollars, the section of Hoyt Road is part of the US Route 4 and is under the jurisdiction of New Hampshire DOT. This, believe it or not, the state of New Hampshire has never uh, cited, and they still have not, uh, even though we've request, requested many times to include this in area for improvements, and they've not. But the city stepped up. Uh, we feel this project is important. So part of the improvements there, we reconfigured and reconstructed the Hoyt Road, Whitney Road, uh, and the old Boyce Road intersection into a two-lane roundabout with pedestrian and landscape improvements. We reconfigured and reconstructed the southbound on ramps from Hoyt Road to onto I-93. Reconfigured the Hoyt Road, Hannah Dustin Drive re intersection. Construction of a roundabout at the intersection of Whitney Road, uh, Concord Crossing, the, and which would be the primary driveway into the project. Uh, 
and of course all the various drainage and roadway improvements that go with it. So the city really stepped up, I think, in this in terms of this project and and working with all the different partners, the developer, the state, etc. Uh, so that's positive. Um, the it's about. Um, 12.1 million in assessed value. Uh, <clears throat> that's about 378,000 in t new taxes. And then the new assessed value is about 293 uh, in new taxes as well. So it'll be a two lane hybrid roundabout currently under construction next to 17, Whitney Road intersection. Um, obviously, I think from our perspective, my perspective, these are really much needed safety improvements. Um, and I think uh, it's, you don't have to be out there long to realize that there are over 20,000 cars that go by there a day. So along with the single lane on the uh, Whitney Road, Merchants Way, and the two new roundabouts, I think they'll provide safe, easy access into, the, um, into this development. And I think the positive is it's going to spur a whole lot more development in that area that potentially will go all the way down to the Sewell's Falls Road. So that's the last thing I'll say before I bring up Tom is that since we're talking about roads, uh, the city council did add last year additional money. Uh, we're now at $2.4 million for our uh, road paving. So um, you can check on our city website. You can see where we'll be doing the paving this year. I'll apologize right now for uh, the construction, but, um, but uh, there's much roads need to be done along with some of our sidewalks, et cetera, and you'll see that done this summer. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom and you know. Tim said, "Keep it moving." So uh, we'll, get, we'll get going. So the um, first up, I'll just give you an update. Uh, I talked about this at the last uh, last year's discussion. That's the city stable. Uh, that's at one uh, one eleven and a half. Uh, Warren Street, uh, that was uh, the building where the, um, the General Services Department worked out of before the Combined Operation Maintenance Facility was built up on, built up on North State Street. Uh, so it's called uh, the city stable because everything was uh, with horses back then. Um, this property was transferred to the school district, Concord School District, my pick of them, to, to the Concord School District in 1994 when the high school addition was put on. It has since uh, the City Council and the Concord School District have agreed to actually transfer it back to the city. We, receive, we work with the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services, got a, a grant to do the complete environmental analysis of this property. So you're going to see testing going on out there with the idea that we're working with the Abbott uh, Downing Historical Society and this will become a museum for the Concord coaches which are scattered about uh, the Merrimack Valley right now. So that is, that is moving along. You're all familiar with the uh, gas holder house. Um, project that's going on. We have a memorandum of understanding after the city council agreed that this is a building that we wanted to save. Um, you can see Carlos Bahia on the deputy city manager on the left here. He's been heading this up, working with um, uh, Liberty Utilities and the uh, New Hampshire Preservation um, Alliance. And the, actually the work has started to actually preserve the building uh, from a structural standpoint and then we'll actually be taking on uh, pieces working with them uh, to actually try to start any type of renovation uh, for the future for this. So that work is ongoing. Uh, I don't think any um, Chamber of Commerce State of the City address would be complete without a discussion of the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, so if you, when you're coming in this morning, if you smelled the, uh, the, uh, the odor of the, the, the uh, fields being spread uh, across the river, that is not us. Uh, that, that is uh, the, uh, all the uh, corn fields and the farmers doing uh, great work out there taking care of uh, their fields for the spring. But this is a project the city council is very much interested. We had in the fiscal year 23, 24, and 25 budget, those are the next three coming up, we had plans to replace the secondary water clarifier. So water comes into the plant, wastewater comes into the plant, goes into a primary clarifier, to a secondary clarifier, and then into the river, then down to Manchester for the drinking water. <laughs> that's, how, that's, how, that's how it works. And uh, so we want to make sure it's clean for our neighbors. So, uh, and we do, and, and it's, done, it's done very well. Uh, this whole project is $3.8 million. We received a $760,000 grant if we bundled all those together. And that work is, uh, is going on now. I just, um, when, you, when you think about your water, particularly for you, uh, 
people in the commercial field here, when your water and wastewater rates, most of those cost increases that you see over time are related to capital improvements. This plant is 40 years old. It's now time to start replacing a lot of the work that was built uh, when this was built way back then in 1980. So a lot of the projects that you see are capital projects and of course there's borrowing costs associated with that. So that's what we're doing here. That project will be completed in the spring of 23. This is, um, thought you'd be interested in this. This is one of the new uh, high efficiency blowers that were put in place. This is a um, $100,000 piece of equipment down at the wastewater treatment plant. I know it's not very great looking, but it is, uh, we received a $67,000 grant from Unitil. And if you think about the, the way these things work, this is a very high efficiency uh, pump. And what that will do is gonna save us dramatically on our electric costs and also save us on our energy costs. So this is uh, um, really important. Um, again, we got a grant for $67,000 for this. Between all the LED improvements, the electrical improvements we've done down at the plant, over the first three months of this year, we've already seen a reduction of 10% in our energy uses. And think about, this is probably the highest energy using um, facility in the entire city. So any energy that you can save here is gonna save not only on your rates, but also help the environment. The, again, I'll keep moving along. Uh, up to the water, we'll go upriver to the water treatment facility. That station that you see going on there, actually that's replacing uh, the, the original station that was built in 1948. Um, city Council approved this. It was uh, just over $4 million, about $4 million to do this. This is the plant that pumps all the water out to all your homes and businesses overnight. So the water comes, is pumped up from either the, the uh, it's either already in the lake or coming up from the Pentecook River, comes to this plant, then goes out to all the water tanks uh, throughout the city. So this is very important. Uh, it's, it's, um, the, the, it's gonna be all high efficiency. If you think about that, it's going to save a lot on energy and save a lot on chemicals. Chemicals are going up dramatically. So we'll be using less chemicals, we'll be using less energy to, uh, to get that water out to you. Just a couple other little projects we're associated with this. And this, I think, um, a shout out to, I think he's in the audience, uh, I know he's in the audience somewhere, Rob Warner, former city councilor. Very, very uh, good at the energy, in the energy field and gives us a, a lot of advice on uh, improvements to make. So we're actually, on those water tanks that I mentioned, we're actually replacing the electrical feeds on those with solar, with solar um, uh, plants. Uh, actually onto the water tanks. And if you think about those water tanks are way out into the woods, so the ones on Snow Pond, the one over on Auburn Street, you think about there's a line that goes out there, that road needs to be maintained. Well, if it's done by solar, you don't have that line anymore. You don't have to worry about the trees falling down on it, knocking out the power to it. Um, really reduces our costs and actually saves money. So you're going to see work on Auburn Street and Snow Pond this year to do those. And um, many of you have probably seen over time the LED street program that's going on. Dana, don't worry, I'm watching the time. Thank you. Um, and uh, the, uh, just so you know, that was a $630,000 project. We received $325,000 grant from Unitil. Um, that is gonna be on, on bill financing for 60 months. That'll save us $600,000 over the next 10 years in energy costs, which is the equivalent of 473 metric tons of carbon dioxide removed <coughs> from the environment. If you think about that, that's also the equivalent of about 523,774 pounds of coal that would be burnt, but who would burn coal in, uh, in this area, right? Nobody, nobody burns coal, there's no coal plants. So, there's, um, so that uh, saves, saves that. Next project, you're gonna start to see the city council discuss this item. This is Langley Parkway phase three, which has been in the planning stages for 60 years. This is a 2015 um, uh, plan, and, and what I'll show you is a, uh, this is just a general area that the Concord Hospital is on your left, Booton Street and down by the Concord Fire Headquarters is down on your right. This is the roundabout concept that came along um, back in uh, 2016, and we'll be looking at doing this. A lot of things are driving this. Um, the, uh, the study from the uh, fire department in terms of access and time it takes to get from the north part of the city and the east part of the city to Concord Hospital. This will dramatically reduce that, that time frame. Also, you have Brady Sullivan has purchased the Lincoln Financial property and they're looking at doing a major development out there. So that's right along this route. 
And of course, Concord Hospital is always in a, in a growth mode. And if you're actually down in the Booten Street, North State Street area, you're gonna notice there's a lot of property that's undeveloped there or underdeveloped there. The reason for that is because this is where that terminates, and those property owners are looking, say, what should we do with this property? But we uh, would like to do something, but we don't know how this is going to actually affect that property. This would, so this would come out right in the area of the Boys and, and Girls Club. This is about 8,500 feet in total length. It can be actually between 62 and 78 feet in width, depending if you put a median. And um, there's very little impact on wetlands. The city's acquired most of the property, and we're probably looking at a cost about 17 to 18 million dollars to build a, a project like this. Another one that you're all interested in, Loudoun Road Bridge Replacement. This is the bridge that goes over the Merrimack River. It needs to be done before the 93 project can take place. Uh, this is on the state's uh, red listed uh, bridge program. And right now it has minimal uh, pedestrian accommodations. As you know, there's only uh, five foot uh, wide sidewalks. There's no provisions for bicycles, uh, very little shoulder. And actually, there's that dangerous skew when you're coming from, uh, from uh, the heights coming down, you know, you have to kind of jockey your way whether you're getting onto the highway or not, so we want to eliminate that. So this is the uh, uh, plan for that, and that would, uh, we'd maintain three westbound lanes, would have two eastbound lanes, the bridge would go in total width from 77 feet to 90 feet. Um, and the money, the state has put the, agreed to put the money into this, uh, thanks to the mayor and the city council. Um, working with the state on this. You'd have a 14 foot wide multi-use path on the north side of the bridge, because remember this is going to be a major leg as connection for the uh, Merrimack River Greenway Trail, which goes all the way down uh, all along Merrimack River uh, and all the way up to, um, to Vermont and beyond. You'd have a six foot wide sidewalk on the south side of the bridge, you'd have five foot wide shoulders on both sides, and you'd have a four foot um, uh, medium. And also we're looking at, if you can picture the side that connects to uh, uh, the arena, we're also looking at whether or not we can actually put a, a pathway underneath there connecting the arena with the Merrimack River Greenway Trail and Terrell Park in the future so you don't have to go up onto Loudoun Road, you'd be able to go down underneath. That's in the planning stages. Merrimack River Greenway Trail. In July of 21, because uh, there's a lot of interest in this, we get calls on this uh, really monthly from different folks. Um, the city went to enter into an agreement with Pan Am uh, to buy a 5.6 mile segment. And this is really from, if you think about it, from really the fire headquarters all the way to the Bosquin line. The state of New Hampshire, and this is with all rail lines throughout the uh, state, has right of first refusal. So they stepped in, took over our um, purchase and sales. Uh, we then terminated our agreement with Pan Am and they're working on that now. Uh, and we're, so we're working with the state on how can we make this happen and, uh, and um, hopefully I'll have news for the city council on Monday night. So we'll see how, we'll see how that goes because we've been working at this for many, many years now trying to acquire this property. There's another section of this. Uh, this is the section over by, um, that's Terrell Park, exit 13 at the bottom um, and about halfway up heading towards the, uh, the fields. And then exit 14 is just to the north of that. The city applied for grant through land and water conservation, received $275,000. The Friends of the Merrimack River Greenway Trail are also raising dollars now. They're going to be doing a uh, community development tax investment uh, uh, program, getting tax credits, and they've also raised some cash. And so hoping to see that construction um, going very soon, and we, uh, we'll know a lot more this summer on that. Uh, pay attention for McKee Square. I think most of you know that where that is. So if you're coming in from exit 13, particularly with all the growth that has occurred in State Office Park, this is probably the one of the most dangerous uh, areas involved. The city was going to do a lot of work here uh, several years ago, then jumped to exit 16, did the exit 16 roundabout, then jumped over um, and uh, did the, uh, decided to do the, because um, the economic opportunity that was coming up, the exit 17 project, so now we're gonna be heading back to McKee Square. And if you can see, there's a lot of connections here, there's a lot going on, uh, so we'll, we'll be talking with the community about what's the best solutions here to provide that access. Again, as a state campus, the uh, Gallon Office Park has uh, redeveloped, there's more and more activity flowing through here all the time, so we've gotta clean up that safety area. I-93, and Tim, um, this is it. Um, this is where we are on that working with the state. We're in agreement with the exit 12 design that the state wants to do. For exit 13, we, have, we still have concerns we've voiced. 
with the idea is the state will um, improve that ramp that's coming off heading northbound to tie into Manchester Street. The concern we have there is that that will just take all the traffic that's now backing up on the highway and back it up onto Manchester Street. Well, down on Manchester Street, we have all the development that's occurring there. We have Pitco that's coming. We, as the mayor mentioned, we also have um, uh, Graponi Mazda, we, but we also have that entire exit 13, the former uh, drive-in site that needs to be developed. We don't want that all messed up with traffic that's just going to be dumped from uh, the state highway onto our highway. Mm -hmm. So we want to work with the state on a new design for the, uh, that exit 13 ramp. Exit 14, the, oh, we'll go right, go back, back to that. Exit 14, we'll come to, remember the, the state's plan was to eliminate the northbound ramp from Loudon Road, so that would go away. Uh, we have some ideas on um, working with them so that doesn't get eliminated, but we have a lot going on. If you think about it, you have that ramp section, you have Stickney Ave, you then have the rail corridor, then you have Store Street somewhere in there, it has to tie in there, then you have um, uh, North Main Street. So we, we don't think you need all of that work out there uh, in terms of roadway, and we can work together to, um, to make that work as part of the I-93 design. We met with the state uh, recently, and we hope to have some more information to you shortly. And done, Tim. <laughs> Folks, we're right up at 9 o'clock, but I, they, uh, the manager and the mayor are kind enough to do a couple of questions. If anyone has something they can really like to ask, um, we'll just take a few minutes. Yes, sir. Uh, Michael Walsh. EMS calls, increase in police calls. We know health care costs are going up, and we know that there's an increase in, in drug abuse across the country. We also know that there's a lot of teenagers who are starting to abuse drugs, and there's a normalization happening with drinking while driving and smoking marijuana while driving. So when you think about the tax that you're getting back for every liter of alcohol or every pack of cigarettes or every you know cannabis product that we're selling, um, and then you look at the cost of the city for all of the emergency services that are being provided and all the health care that are being provided. Do you have a good sort of cost-benefit analysis for this? Do you know how much it's costing the city for every liter of alcohol we're selling and every you know, cigarette pack that we're selling versus the, the cost that's costing the city for all these services? The short answer is no. Uh, but. Um, the city participated along with some other communities in the state as well as the state in the lawsuit with um, uh, yeah, Big Farmer, however you put it. So, yeah. <coughs> so uh, one, of, one of the issues, what we're trying to do is recoup as many, uh, actually identify those types of costs and recoup as much of those dollars from Stokelys and all the other people, Stokelys, whatever. They and the other groups out there. The problem is that the uh, state has decided that they're going to take over a lot of the, the lawsuit action and um, essentially capture all the money and then decide whether or not they want to distribute the money, which doesn't work for us. Because uh, essentially we would do all the work. They would actually keep all the money and then very, virtually none would come to the cities. So what we've been trying to do is, as you mentioned, uh, with alcoholism up what, 25%, um, the opioid issue is, is still real. Um, meth is becoming more prevalent. Uh, heroin, um, and actually these, uh, I've been talking to uh, some, uh, some local nurses on this lately, there's actually other drugs you can buy now that to very, very, get very, very cheaply to take with heroin. Heroin and increases uh, that actually that high by about <coughs> six times uh, uh, at a very cheap cost. So this is, this is what, the police department is facing, and, and we're seeing this, and I'm going on a little bit here, but we're seeing this in injuries to police officers because they're coming upon people and whether in, 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 who have actually on these drugs and are actually injuring them, and then that, it, that is impacting our, our cost of workers' compensation costs, and then, then they're out and have to replace them with, with overtime. And actually the fire department is facing the same thing. They're constantly going to the same sites the same, the same people who are overdosing and having problems. So we don't have a number on, uh, there's, no, there's no correlation between anything that the state is really collecting uh, and that comes back to us but that we can offset with additional services. It's probably just some little pieces of dollars where we can run enhanced programs 
you know, ten thousand dollars here, fifteen thousand dollars there, and uh, Greg, Greg gives me a, a report that you know shows, uh, you know, we'll get fifteen thousand dollars correction on the program of our lot road, but what does it really do? You know, it, it does something, but so no, this, this I, I don't think this the state as a whole has faced that issue. One final question. Yes, ma'am. My name is Tracy Bricky, and I uh, serve on the Merrimack Valley School Board, and I um, was an educator for 35 years. I, um, not once did you mention Merrimack Valley School District, which has, serves all the students from Pennacook. Um, you mentioned the exit 17 and the new tax revenue dollars. Um, which sounds like a lot, but not once have you responded and um, <coughs> decided to meet with the Merrimack Valley School District about sharing those tax revenues. And I know in the past that you've shared tax revenues from TIF districts with the Concord School District. You, you need to remember that Pennacook is part of Concord. You showed a bunch of Pennacook slides, but not once did you talk about the students in Pennacook. Um, so I would like for the city council, because I don't believe that they have even heard that the Merrimack Valley School District would like to uh, negotiate with the city on that those tax revenue dollars, those new tax revenue dollars that are coming from the TIF district, um, which you expanded from 43 to 230 acres, um, which will have a tremendous impact on all the students in the Merrimack Valley School District. So were you at the meeting that? I was not able to be there. OK, so well, I thought you just said there was no meeting. Uh, you were aware you there was were. a meeting. You weren't. Oh, thank you. Okay. So there was a meeting, um, what was she referring to? There was a meeting between, um, I think, Councilor Kredovic, also Councilor um, Brent Todd and myself with the school district. We did we discussed all things that you just brought up, which you said were not discussed. So I right, so did you talk about sharing the tax revenue? Yes, we did. And did and why won't you? Because it's paying for the cost of the improvements of the project. And why do you occur. why did you share them with why did you share the previous TIF districts with the Concord School District and you won't with the Merrimack Valley School District? You know what? I'd be glad to continue. If you want to come to a meeting next time, I'd be glad to have one with you. And but I would like to share with you this. This is a this is a very important point of the effect of property taxation and, and valuations. Okay? So you've seen a reduction. We talk often about the municipal rate of your tax bill. No matter where you live in the city, whether it be in Panacook or, or Hope Street in the South End the exact same cost it is to serve municipal services. The difference becomes in the school district costs. That's where you see the difference between the Merrimack Valley School District rate and the Concord District rate. So one of the impacts has been what was known as Wheel of Raider, and I can't remember, I apologize, their new company name now, but their assessed value has dropped by over $50 million. It just so happens that if you were to calculate the rates difference, it's that one taxpayer and the reduction of that value has had the most impact on the Merrimack Valley School District in terms of the differentials in rates. So it's when we talk about, and, and you may think it's fluff, but when we talk about the quality of life and adding projects like what we're seeing the Rossios do and such, that additional tax base, it is over a long period of time that we're going to see a marked difference because we can't rely on that one taxpayer like we had in the past, in the future. I'm going to use the bully pulpit and call an end to this meeting. I want to thank you all very much for being here today. I want to thank Bar Harbor Wealth Management for sponsoring this. Um, uh, my congratulations to Detective uh, on that great award and also Firefighter Patterson. And thank uh, Mayor Boulay and Thomas Spell. That was a fantastic presentation. Lots of great information. Thank you all for being here.